Boldwood presents There's No Place Like Home, written by Jane Lovering and read by Rose Robinson. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. This week's TV, Channel Listings Magazine. Tonight, UK Wildlife Channel, 9.30pm. New series, Hunting the Hidden. Four teams of members of the public, each with a celebrity tracker, searching for mysterious giant cats around the UK. Each team is living wild in the surrounding countryside and filming themselves as they search for evidence, which will be evaluated by experts back in the studio. With £50,000 prize money for scientific proof and £250,000 for a captured animal to be won, expect competitive sightings and mistaken identities galore. Chapter 1 The rain dripped through the tent roof and plopped disconsolately onto the nylon beneath. We were all already so wet that nobody paid it any attention, but we shifted occasionally to keep out of the rapidly forming puddle in the middle of the ground sheet. At last, the girl who'd complained really loudly during the five-mile walk across the moors and whose makeup was beginning to come off in patches, leaving her with uneven eyebrows, said, I thought it would be like Love Island. She sounded on the verge of tears. The man sitting next to her patted her arm briefly. If it's any consolation, he said, I didn't really read the description either. I'd envisaged sitting in a comfortable hide somewhere with coffee. I looked around at the assorted collection of soggy humanity in the tent with me. We were three women and two men all of us wearing almost all the clothes we possessed under the provided waterproofs, which weren't. Huge boots covered in mud, and expressions ranging from the mildly cheated to about to sue. I wish this so-called celebrity would show up. Another man. He'd turned off his body cam and microphone, I noticed. We were supposed to keep them on 24-7, unless asleep or going to the toilet although there was very little to choose between this tent and lavatorial activities when I looked at it. Damp trousers either way. Then maybe we could get something to eat. I hope we get Bear grills. Odd eyebrow girl produced a mirror and began repairing her face. Her accent was so sharply upper class that she could have used it to cut her way out of the tent. It would be the only thing that could make this worthwhile. That and the quarter of a mill we win. This was coffee in a hide, man. Should... I began cautiously, and everyone turned to look at me, rain-soaked hair flicking so that the inside of the tent pattered with more water. Should we introduce ourselves? If we're going to be stuck together in tents for the next few weeks on these moors, we should at least know the names of our fellow captives. I smiled trying for a weak joke to lighten the atmosphere. I'm Izzy, short for Isabel. I'm from York, and I saw the ad for the new reality show and wrote in. I didn't really care what happened from there on. I looked expectantly at the man to my left, the one who'd turned his comms off. He gave me a slightly dirty look, as though I'd put him on an unexpected spot, but unless he wanted to be known as camera off man for the next month. He didn't have much of a choice. My name's McKinley, he muttered, from Glasgow. He didn't tell us what he'd expected from the chirp he had, but he did look as though fame and fortune were not his primary goal. Eyebrow Woman was called Kanga, although I very much doubted that was her real name. We already knew about the Love Island expectations and a very great deal more about life in a big house in Notting Hill with a million handbags and large disposable income than we could ever want to know. On my other side, a quiet and very young-looking girl who'd said nearly nothing so far introduced herself as Ruth. I just wrote in asking if they had anything I could be on, she said sadly. I didn't really think it through, did I? This left the remaining man. He'd been talkative during our hike, 
and had put himself in charge of the map reading, which had got us here to these ready-pitched tents on this wind-flapped stretch of the North York Moors. He seemed capable and practical, and his face, under his Sherpa-style hat, was weather-beaten and brown. He looked slightly older than the rest of us. I'm Sebastian, he said. I'm a farmer from Sussex, and, as I said, I didn't quite realise what this was going to involve. He glanced around the group. I think we're all wondering what has hit us, aren't we? We all went quiet again. I remembered the email that had come as a reply to my request for information on the show. Hi, Izzy. We're starting out filming a new game-slash-reality show next autumn. Adventure and exploration, and the chance to win a massive cash prize. If you'd be interested, please get in contact, sending your name, age, a little bit about yourself, and a head and shoulders picture to abcadventures at gmail.com. Dax Williams. Yes, they'd actually written game slash reality instead of punctuating it. That should have tipped me off to the type of thing I was dealing with. But then, I was desperate. I looked around again. From their expressions, backs hunched against the wet fabric of the tent. The others were also recalling that they'd been promised adventure and exploration, and that, on the evidence so far, those particular elements had been oversold to us. The likely trench foot, dysentery, and the opportunity to be knifed to death by one of our fellow participants had, by the looks of it, been undersold to an almost criminal degree. I don't suppose, Ruth said cautiously, that there's any chance we could just go back and say we've changed our minds. Another silence, into which the rain plopped and the outside of the tent shivered as a breeze ran past on its way to somewhere more salubrious. We signed something, I think, I said, when nobody else had anything to contribute. To say we accepted their conditions? At this point, everyone started to talk at once. Didn't know it was going to be like this. We'll be fine once the rain stops and we settle down. The money will come in useful. I mean, at least they're paying us to be here. Bear Grylls better turn up soon. They wouldn't let me bring my makeup case and I've only got a spoonful of cover-up left. I've got a lovely place in Notting Hill and I wouldn't have come, only my agent told me this would be the quickest way into a presenting job. McKinley, from Glasgow, I noticed, didn't say anything. He'd got his knees under his chin in an attempt to keep his boots out of the rapidly increasing puddle in the centre of the tent, and he looked disgruntled to the point that his gruntle might be waving farewell forever. I smiled at him. Nothing to add? I asked. He turned a look on me that was so sour I could feel my tongue dry out. You're the cheerleader then, are you? He said. There's always one Pollyanna. Going to tell us it's not as bad as it could be. Izzy's only being pleasant. This was Sebastian, who'd taken off his Sherpa hat now to reveal blonde hair standing in points. She's right. We're going to have to exist together and rely on one another to get through this. There's no point in being rude for the sake of it. McKinley averted his gaze. Yeah, he said. Sorry. But he wasn't looking at me, and he didn't sound as though he really meant it. My heart had dropped. Yes, actually, I had been about to point out that at least we had tents and we'd be heading to our permanent campsite tomorrow, where we'd been promised food and a proper toilet. It might be raining, but at least it wasn't snow or frost, and we were being paid to be here, to say nothing of the putative prize money if we managed to find evidence of some kind of what Dax had called an anomalous creature. Quite frankly, it could have been worse, and I didn't think that made me a twinkly starshine girl. It's realistic. At that moment, there was the sound of a vehicle outside, and we all leapt to our feet and started trying to look like a bunch of reality TV contestants rather than wet, cold and tired campers. Kanga consulted her mirror again, then snapped it away. 
do you really think we'll get Bear grills? I asked her as we filed our way out through the tent flap. How many trackers who are celebrities are there? She pulled down the zip at the front of her jacket. At a guess, she was used to doing this to flash her cleavage. All she was showing was a down-filled gilet, but the thought was there. Outside the tent, there was still a lot of rain. The sky was leaden and didn't seem filled with the promise of sunny frolics, and beyond the camp was a jeep. In the jeep was Dax, who was the man behind the show. He leapt out, all legs and expensive waterproofs. With him were a cameraman, who'd been briefly introduced to us back in Leeds as Callum, and a sound man who seemed to go by Steve. I was beginning to realise why the introductions had been brief. Presumably Dax hadn't wanted them to let any details slip, in case we ran away en masse. Oh, good, you're all here, he trilled. I wasn't sure whether he'd expected us to have walked off or hidden from him, but given the conditions, it would have been a fair assumption. Any questions so far? Ruth put her hand up cautiously. Um, Dax, is... well, is this it? It? Dax looked baffled inside his enormously fluffy, down-filled hood, from which his face protruded past the tightly fastened toggle. He was wearing big, round-framed glasses, so the effect was that of being addressed by an owl in an anorak. Well, yes. The premise of the show, as I think we've gone over, is that you're all out here looking for evidence of anomalous creatures. Big cats, that sort of thing. He looked around our Spartan site once more. You have to carry all your things, you see. Move from place, he indicated with his hands, as though we were all unfamiliar with the concept of motion. To place, do you see? Carrying your things, whilst tracking. Another grim silence resulted. Whilst the premise of the show hadn't exactly indicated five-star hotel rooms and spa treatments, the element of deprivation conjured by the tent, the rain and the gear, hadn't, I was fairly sure, been covered in sufficient detail. The five of us huddled closer together. Darkness was beginning to cray on its way around the edges of the moor, and the early November wind was sharp. We were wet, cold, hungry and tired, and I hoped that Dax wasn't readying a pep talk because we were likely to rush him and steal the keys to the jeep. Callum shouldered his camera nervously. He was young and looked as though this might be his first real job that didn't involve burgers. Anyway, I've brought you your tracker. Dax carried on, a little uncertainly. Everyone, I'd like you to meet Bo Jr. Akasi. Another man peeled himself out of the jeep. He was enormously tall, wearing only a T-shirt which showed off tattoos a little darker than his skin, and army trousers tucked into calf-high, laced-up boots. His head was shaved to a shiny baldness, and he looked as though he'd have been more at home gunning down insurgents with an AK-47 than camping out in the moors of North Yorkshire. Hi, we all chorused, except McKinley, who was still silent. Junior is a very well-known tracker in the US, Dax was talking quickly, where he hosts a show tracking Bigfoot for one of the cable channels. I wondered if he was talking fast to try to distract us from thinking about what made a celebrity. I had certainly never watched any cable channel Bigfoot programmes, and, from the expressions on my fellow captives' faces, neither had they. Junior raised a hand in greeting. I watched Kanga stare at his muscles. They were improbably large. He looked as though someone had taken an ordinary man and inflated him with a bike pump in strategic areas. Hi, he said, his voice so deep as to be practically infrasound. I'm looking forward to tracking this here big cat of yours. Yes, well, we don't actually know that there's a big cat. Dax, looking flustered, went on, still speaking fast. 
That's the point of the show, you see. We've got groups all over the country trying to find proof. There's a group on Bodmin Moor, looking for the Beast of Bodmin, and one up in the Highlands of Scotland, and another in Cannock Chase, all places where out-of-place animals have been sighted recently. The show revolves around you all finding that evidence. He sounded as though he'd been pitching that idea in the same combination of words for so long that he was parroting it without really thinking about what it meant. For us, out here in on the moors, it evidently meant wet, mud and misery. We shuffled about in a discontented way, like a herd of cows seeing the vet on the horizon, but nobody actually said, who's going to watch a bunch of people getting rained on and arguing and not finding anything? Compared to some of the game shows currently on TV, this was practically genius-level viewing. Plus, there's the whole social element. Dax loosened a toggle and reached a hand inside his enormously insulated coat to push hair back under the hood. This is why we've asked you to keep your cameras and microphones on at all times. People will be fascinated watching a group of such disparate people trying to cooperate and establish their positions within the group. I'm seeing it as a sort of Big Brother meets Love Island. He did the choppy thing with his hands again. With elements of survival of the fittest, you see. He finished, now sounding slightly desperate. Steve coughed and adjusted the boom mic. With enormous overtones of Lord of the Flies. This was McKinley, speaking for practically the first time without being spoken to first. His gruntle was still not in evidence. Yes, well, that's up to you, isn't it? Dax said waspishly. And Mac, turn your camera back on for the love of God. We can all see that your live feed isn't enabled. Looking as though he would happily club Dax to death with a tent peg, Mac grumpily groped about inside his jacket, and the little light showing he was recording blinked on his shoulder. Right, I'll leave you all to get to know one another then. Dax began shuffling towards the jeep without turning his back on us. Perhaps he assumed that Mac really would attempt murder if he didn't keep an eye on him. And then tomorrow, you can start out over the moors. We're setting up the campsite now, and we'll send the coordinates tomorrow morning. Unless, of course, Junior picks up the track of an animal in the meantime. Tomorrow? Sebastian's head came up. What do we eat tonight, then? Dax's retreat got faster. Uh, I think there may be basic supplies in your packs. We all looked towards the rucksacks we'd been given. They lay in a damp pile outside the tent and were not giving off four-course dinner vibes. By the time we all looked up again, Dax, Callum and Steve were speeding away in the jeep, only visible because the lights were bouncing their way across the moor. It was almost completely dark and raining again. Well, that's a bit of a bugger, Sebastian said. I was at least hoping that they'd send us in someone to cook. Everyone chimed in here with their own expectations, and it became evident that we'd all been fed different stories about what the living environment would be whilst we were tracking the probably mythical animals. Kanga had been told there would be accommodation provided, from which she had deduced that there would be guest houses, hot showers and comfortable beds. Ruth and Sebastian thought that all needs catered for meant that we'd be bussed to a nearby town when filming finished, to hotels. Mac, once again, didn't say anything, and I had to admit that I hadn't really thought about it. Someone had mentioned paying us £100 per day whilst we were out here, and then they dangled the prize money, and I would have agreed to sleep in a cave wrapped in leaves for a chance at that. We'd better eat, rumbled Junior. Gonna be a long day tomorrow. Nobody asked how he knew this. I think we'd had all our ability to question anything squashed under the insistent rain and the amount of mud that clung to our boots and doubled our body weight. Happy campers, we were not. 
after a few moments wrangling the baggage. Sebastian, who seemed to have become our de facto leader, in his own head if nowhere else, wrenched out a small primus stove and some packets of what looked horribly like dehydrated animal feed. He sent Kanga and Ruth to fetch some water from the stream we could hear rushing its ominous way past the campsite, whilst he and Junior assembled the food, and Mac and I were designated in charge of the Primus, and told to light the stove and get it going somewhere out of the wind. But not inside the tent, Sebastian said sternly. People can die from carbon monoxide inhalation that way. Mutinously, and showing all the team working ability of a bunch of cats, we each set off on our allocated tasks. Mac and I dragged the Primus round the back of the tent, where the wind was slightly less omnipresent, and a small tree kept the worst of the rain off. So, how do you come to be out here with us? I asked him, holding up one of the provided torches so he could see to set the stove up. In deference to having been accused of cheerleading, I tried not to sound as though I cared about his reply. Which was just as well, because there wasn't one. Mac ignored me totally, other than grabbing the torch to direct the beam more closely in while he fiddled with a knob. There was a hiss of gas, a spark as he lit a match, and the primus flamed into feeble life. It's hardly going to make riveting viewing if we don't find anything to track, though, is it? I continued, talking to his back now as he rummaged around to find the frame to stand the food containers on over the flame. A bunch of people blundering around the moors. I might as well not have been there for all the notice he took. He turned a few more knobs and the height of the flame went up and down. Then, evidently satisfied, he set the frame over the apparatus and sat back on his heels, holding his hands out to the warmth of the fire. His absorption in the task annoyed me. Look, we don't have to like each other, but if we're going to be stuck out here, the least you can do is be vaguely polite, I snapped. I don't know if you're trying to cast yourself as the mean and moody one of the group, but I've seen enough reality TV to know that you're making yourself unpopular does not go down well with the audience. There was another moment's silence, broken only by the hiss and rush of the flame and the distant sounds of Kanga and Ruth getting wet down in the stream. Then, to my surprise, Mac turned around and stood up. He did it quickly, too with a grace that was unexpected in someone wearing so many clothes that their arms stuck out sideways. Yeah, he said, still sounding fed up. You're right. Sorry. I'm just hugely pissed off at being here at all. I stared at what I could see of him. The low gas flame didn't illuminate much more than his boots. Well, fine, but... I don't think any of us are composing a song and dance routine about it. And surely you signed yourself up for this. Mac sighed. No, no, I didn't. He took off the beanie hat that covered most of his head and ran a hand through his hair. I got co-opted. Dax is my brother, you see. One of the men that was meant to be part of your team suddenly had to drop out and it was too late to put someone else through the vetting procedures, and Dax, well, let's say he brought family pressure to bear on me. Hence? He shrugged and pulled the hat back on. This is not my idea of a great holiday, he said dismally. I don't think it's anyone's idea of any kind of holiday, I said reasonably. There you go again with the cheerful but he sounded as if he was smiling as he said it this time. So, why are you here? What made Mrs. Upbeat decide to fester away in this mud-soaked hellhole? The flame flickered and spat. Somewhere behind us, Sebastian and Junior were muttering about the food. Well, Sebastian was. Junior was probably talking, but his deep bass was just uprooting trees and diverting river courses. I need the money. I said, deciding that prevarication wouldn't do me any favours. I want to rent somewhere to live and there's no family money for a deposit and I don't earn enough to ever save up what's needed. 
I want... I tailed off. My camera and microphone were still on, and I didn't want to go into gut-wrenching detail for the viewers. Enough of them would, hopefully, empathise with the basic desire for somewhere to live. There's nothing lost if we don't find any evidence, though. I tried for cheerful within reasonable and comprehensive boundaries. At that point, Ruth and Kanga arrived with a container of water. I had to go into the stream for this, Kanga said, in the same tones as one might announce that they had to fly to Vancouver. It was too muddy near the edges. Ruth sounded a lot more practical. I thought I probably liked her, but the jury was still out on Kanga. We used to go camping with the church youth group. I remembered that you're supposed to take the water from where it's flowing fastest. Oh, thank God, said Sebastian. Someone who knows about camping. Amen, Ruth said. And it sounded as though she meant it. I don't think you understand. Kanga shook a booted foot at us. I am wet. Mac looked around. We were now all grouped tightly around the feeble warmth of the Primus flame, clearly not being filled with gastronomic delight at the sight of the foil dishes of grit and turnip, which appeared to comprise our supper. Wet seems to be fitted as standard, he said rather grimly. I don't think your feet are special. Well, I'm going to change. And with that, Kanga stomped off towards the tiny sleeping tent that was meant to be occupied by the three of us women, but was only going to work if none of us snored or stretched beyond a fetal position. For the first time, I seriously began to wonder what I'd got myself involved in. I needed money, but I was beginning to think that even pole dancing in the local topless bar would have been better than this. I didn't know any of these people, yet... Here I was, looking down the barrel of spending a month in their company, whilst soaked, cold, and with mud drying my skin to prickly irritation. I had thought all reality shows were full of people in swimwear and Botox, prancing around in picturesque places, and I'd never seriously considered I'd be a contender. But it had seemed like a gamble worth taking. Any swimwear out here would be swiftly followed by hypothermia and a trip to the local hospital where I had to concede. At least it would be warm, indoors, and the food would be edible. Here. Sebastian poked a foil container my way. I'm not sure what it is, but it's warm and... Well, actually, it isn't anything else. But eat it anyway, all right? In a sullen little huddle, we all sat on a ground sheet under the branches of the overhanging tree which dripped its cheerless plops of water around us as we ate in silence. Over at the tents, an occasional bulge of canvas or muffled swear word told us that Kanga was still getting changed. What she was changing into, bearing in mind we'd been told to wear as many of our clothes as possible to save carrying them, I didn't like to think. It probably wasn't going to be a charming and helpful person. The food tasted mostly of dehydrated boiled swede, but I'd lived with cold chips and leftovers for long enough to wolf it down without smelling it, or letting it touch my tongue. The true horror of my situation was beginning to dawn on me. This is it. For a month. To distract myself, I turned to Junior, who was squatting next to me, efficiently scooping the inedible meal into his mouth. So, you're a Bigfoot hunter. That must be interesting. Oh, good grief. Cheerleader had been bad enough. Now I'd come over all gracious and royal, as though only the crumpled foil container in my hand was preventing me from waving. I guess, Junior said, and the tree shook more water down on us. He went back to eating, clearly a man of few words, and I didn't bother trying to squeeze any more out of him. I didn't really feel like conversation either, to be fair. I was tired and disorientated, and all the other things that came with being dumped on a moorland in the rain. Even my usual optimism had vanished. It had probably dissolved. 
Ruth took a container of food over to the tent and poked it through the flap. Here's some food for you, Kanga, she said, averting her eyes to the extent that I wondered if Kanga was naked in there. A muttered reply, and then a long bare arm came out, took the food, and retreated back inside the tent. She says she's going to bed, Ruth reported, returning to us, and doesn't want to be woken. Unless we teleport in, I think she is very much going to be woken, I said, slightly bitterly, and I heard Mac make a sound like a muffled laugh, which he covered by scrunching up his foil dish and putting it in the bag we designated for the rubbish. Cheerfulness beginning to wear off, is it? He muttered to me as I collected the dropped forks to put in the bag as well. I didn't take long. No, I'm still cheerful, I whispered back. I'm just realistic. So you're realistic, and yet you're on a show where we're hunting for panthers in the countryside of Yorkshire. Bit of hypocrisy going on there? His tone of amused condescension scratched against nerves already stripped of the trappings of solid meals, rest, bodily comfort and any pretense of privacy, and I had the brief urge to clock him one with the side of the stove, which wasn't at all like me. Whether we find any evidence or not, I hissed, now without any semblance of cheer, I'm getting a hundred pounds a day, and that's looking pretty good right now. He didn't reply. There was barely any acknowledgement of my having spoken, apart from a sideways inclination of his head, which, with any luck, had sent a trickle of water off his hat down the back of his neck. We all ought to turn in. Sebastian turned off the primus. The dying of the little blue flame was, I thought, probably a reflection of the dying of any hope of a decent night's sleep in all of us. Tomorrow could be worse. I opened my mouth to suggest that it couldn't possibly be worse than this, and then the possibility of storm-force winds, more rain and less food thundered in, and I shut it again. Beside me, Max snorted. I wasn't sure what had provoked the snort, but I didn't want to do anything to cause another reaction. So I said nothing. That's a good idea, Ruth said. Kanga shouldn't be asleep yet, so we won't disturb her if we get to bed now. Oh, and there was me looking forward to a game of gin rummy round the campfire, Max said, and the sarcasm dripped more than the rain did. But I shall manage my disappointment. Hell yeah, Junior put in. Apropos of I wasn't sure what. Come on then, Ruth. I headed toward the tent, where a dim light showed faintly through the flap. I was pretty sure that Kanga wasn't lying in her sleeping bag reading The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, so maybe she'd left the light on for us. Just a moment, Izzy. I would like to pray first. I'll leave you and God to have a chat then. She smiled at me, which made her look even younger, and I wondered how old she was. It was almost impossible to tell what anyone looked like now, what with the hats and an immense amount of clothing and the mud, and I'd barely noticed her before we'd got kitted out. But I wouldn't have put her at much over 18. Only Junior was fully visible in his T-shirt and army boots, but I couldn't make a guess at his age either. I'll be in in a minute. She wandered off behind the tents. The men were packing up the ground sheet we'd sat on and arguing about the best place to put the Primus to cool down, with Sebastian clearly winning out through force of bossiness. But I ignored them and slid inside the tent flat to find that Kanga was sprawled in her sleeping bag in the middle of the floor space. She was asleep, or pretending to be, surrounded by the tissued-off remains of her makeup, which littered the floor disconcertingly like tiny bits of skin. Nothing of her was visible. She'd crawled right down inside the bag and was only a tuft of hair and a lot of orange nylon. But she was snoring in a realistic way, so I tiptoed around her, peeled off a couple of layers of the wettest of my clothing and got into my own sleeping bag. I'd got a sleeping mat underneath me, 
but the ground was still hard. Kanga's sprawl had me almost up against the tent wall, and I could feel a draft snaking its way down the side of the tent. Clearly, the first one to bed had had the best chance of a comfortable night, I thought, and decided that a month of early nights wouldn't do me any harm. Earlier than Kanga, anyway, who twitched and muttered in her sleep as I shifted and shuffled about, trying to get comfortable. But I must have fallen into a sleep born of hunger and exhaustion, because I didn't even hear Ruth come into the tent. Chapter Two I woke in a fug of bodies that hadn't washed recently, and a suspicion of fart. Today looked better. Today looked, in fact, like a 300% improvement on yesterday, with the sun streaming in through the walls of the tent and a cheering lack of wind noise. Around me, Ruth and Kanga lay inert in their bags, glowing slightly orange. I hoped this was because of the light coming through the tent walls and not because last night's dinner had been radioactive and, at the thought of food, my stomach gave a groan that I worried might wake them. Scrambling out of my bag and trying not to stand on anyone, I pulled my big jacket on, wincing at the moist cold of the lining, and crept out through the tent flap to meet the morning. I didn't have to make much effort, because the morning rose up to meet me, with some force. The air was very cold, and shaded blue where the sun wasn't quite getting into all the hollows and dips. Where the sun did reach, mainly the tips of the spindly trees, and a slice of ground near the tents. The light had a brittle look, as though it was frozen in nitrogen and might shatter at a touch. When I looked up, the sky was clear and felt very close. Nobody else was about. There was no sound, no movement. Only me and this azure air, shadows and cold. I took a deep breath, and the bottom of my lungs almost clanged with the impact. A flicker to the side of my vision made me turn. A fox, russet against the blue and dappled among the snatchy growth of heather, stopped for a moment and turned its head my way. We eyeballed one another for a second, then it went back about its foxy business, high trotting down the dale, without a backward look, and I watched it go for lack of anything else to stare at. The damp inside my jacket had made its way through another layer of clothing, and was pressing the back of my neck in a slither of wet nylon, like being licked by my own coat. I took another breath. Only a month. I only had to stand this for a month. Even if we never found anything, even if it was a month of trying not to kill one another, I'd still be three grand nearer safety. I could use it as a deposit on a rental property. I let myself imagine a tiny flat, a kitchen I could cook in, and a bedroom with a door that locked. Only a month. A voice rose from the tent I'd left, in a high crystal note of complaint. It sounded as though Kanga was awake and not happy, and a couple of moments later, she burst out through the tent flap, wearing what I'd learnt yesterday whilst being kitted out by Dax and two directorial assistants, was a base layer. Calling them long johns would probably not have gone down well. Ugh, there's an earwig in there. That's disgusting. She was flapping about and brushing herself off as though she thought she might be covered in them, and instantly the frail piece of the early morning was in tatters. The other tent opened, and the men emerged one after another, popping through the flap like a cartoon. What's the matter? Sebastian, wearing a big coat over his base layer, started towards Kanga and her waving arms. Are you hurt? Insects! Insects everywhere! She overstated, still brushing away at herself. Mac didn't say anything. He turned around and went straight back into the tent again, letting Junior squeeze past him in the entrance. Better make a start. Now we're all awake. Junior was fully dressed, I noticed. Well, fully dressed for him, which seemed to be a thin cotton shirt over those combat trousers. I couldn't imagine Junior in a base layer. Well, no. More precisely, I couldn't imagine a base layer that would fit Junior. 
he'd have to have inserts to allow for all the muscles. Plus, he really didn't seem to feel the cold. Is there breakfast? Ruth asked hopefully, poking her head from our tent. Before we go? Junior was already out, scouting around the campsite, looking at the ground. We have to head to the campsite, he said, eyes trained on the heather. Before we eat. Is it likely to be far? Sebastian was getting dressed out in the open, pulling random layers of clothing on whilst hopping about. Because we really must eat something if it's a long march. Kanga had stopped flailing, I noticed, and was doing something that involved a lot of bending over, presumably to reveal how slim she was and how pert she looked in her minimal clothing. She seemed to have forgotten about the earwig. I wondered if it had been real, or whether it had been her attempt at being noticed. Everyone's camera-on lights were flashing away. Something's been here. Junior bent low. Undergrowth's all must up. Just a fox, I said, without thinking, and he straightened up. Hey, I'm the tracker here, bud, he said, and I couldn't help but take a step back. His muscles were flexing as though he'd got toddlers moving under his skin. But yeah, looks like a fox, he added, grudgingly, eyeballing me again as though he suspected me of having concealed a vulpine about my person solely to make tracks. You know about tracks, huh? Well, not really, I... We should get moving. Mac had appeared again fully dressed now and with his hat pulled down hard over his hair. We've got the map coordinates for the site, and we need to eat. His camera light was off again, I noticed. Kanga was still doing her stretch and bend routine. I thought she was pretending to check the tent ropes, but what she was mostly doing was flaunting her buttocks. Then I caught myself thinking flaunting, and bit the inside of my lip. Kanga? Stick some clothes on, I called across. It's not as warm as it looks out here. Kanga gave me a narrow-eyed look from between her legs, where she was in a cross between a yoga pose and a beachwear modelling shoot, but she didn't say anything. I did see her glance across towards the men, though, to see if they'd noticed her, but only Sebastian was looking, and he was holding out a jacket in her direction. Izzy's right, he said. We need to get moving to warm up. And get to the food, Ruth added. I've prayed for bacon. Do you think there'll be bacon? Only I'm really hungry now. We'd been told, during our briefing, that we'd be based at a permanent campsite, and these tents would be removed later, which at least saved us the humiliation of having to work out how they went up and down. That was probably an entire series on its own, I thought, as we picked up our rucksacks and shouldered them. Mine was heavier than yesterday, I was sure. It dug into my collarbone and settled along my spine in a press of damp cold. My boots were still wet when I tied them on, despite the fact I'd dug out a pair of dry socks. And I was pretty hungry, too. Junior went on ahead, eyes trained on the earth like a hound trying to pick up the trail of a tasty morsel. Mmm, bacon. My mind wandered off in search of food to obsess about as we set out tramping over the moor, Sebastian in charge of the map and the coordinates, as seemingly the only one who'd ever seen a map before. The rest of us moved in a cluster, as though we feared physical separation, with our rucksacks bumping against one another. Kanga was monologuing about how unlike Knightsbridge this was, and how she ought to be sorting her vast collection of designer bags into alphabetical order or something. I wasn't, to be honest, really listening. We're like snails, aren't we? Ruth said eventually. Slimy and mostly feet? I asked. Carrying everything we need on our backs. Making us realise how little we really do need for day-to-day -day living. That we burden ourselves with stuff when all we need, when it comes down to it, is what we can carry. She stopped for a second and took off her hat, shaking dark curls out so that the wind spread them over her shoulders. 
I wondered, cynically for a moment, whether this was a performance for the camera, then stopped that train of thought. Kanga would have done that. Ruth was doing it to let the breeze get to her head. Except that we've got no food or tents, and I'm pretty sure we need those too. Mac drew up alongside us. I don't think our clothes and wet weather gear really constitutes everything we need, does it? His pragmatism annoyed me. I wasn't really sure why, but it probably had a lot to do with the fact that I hadn't had nearly enough sleep or much to eat. Well, we could hunt for our food and build our own shelters, I put in. So clothes are basically what we need. Ruth gave me a big smile, and Mac huffed and walked on past us to catch up with Sebastian and Junior, who were having a minor conference where the heather gave way onto a sandy path. The Lord will provide, Ruth said cheerfully. I hope he provides soon, then, I muttered. My stomach muttered an agreement. Where's Kanga got to? Behind us, over there, Ruth pointed. Kanga was a hundred metres or so in the rear, tramping along almost bent double under her rucksack. I'll go and see if she needs any help. She'll probably want a piggyback. I was still muttering. The constant wind was scraping my nerve endings. The light was too bright and too clear, and my digestive system was, by the feel of it, working on breaking my internal organs down. I was tired, and I was cold, and none of this, none of this, was in my life plan. I had a quick memory of what my vision for my life had been. Comfortable relationship, comfortable flat, and bumbling along through life, perhaps acquiring a couple of children and a dog. I'd had to rewrite that expectation. Even the new version hadn't been so bad, though. It had still held possibilities and a degree of certainty. It had been what came after, when everything had been screwed up and thrown into the air to land in a mess of awful insecurity and shame that had led me to this muddy moor. I still couldn't believe I was out here, with the cold air making my lungs contract and the weight of my rucksack digging into my collarbone. You don't look so cheerful now. Mac had waited for me to catch up with him. Reality getting to you, is it? I thought about being defensive and snapping that reality was doing fine for me, thanks. It was the people inhabiting it that were annoying me. But I didn't. There was something understanding in his tone, and something about the way his brown eyes, which were practically the only part of him visible between the brim of his tugged-down hat and the zipped-up collar of his coat, seemed sympathetic. A bit. Having to admit to some human frailty nearly killed me, but I didn't have the energy for prevarication. Max sighed. Yeah. Do you get the feeling that everything is being invented behind the scenes on a day-to-day -day basis? I turned to face him. It was a staccato move, because my rucksack kept catching the wind and trying to revolve me in the opposite direction. Is that likely? Knowing my brother, it's more than likely. It's practically inevitable. Does that mean... I began, hesitant because I wasn't quite sure I wanted to know. That there might not be any bacon when we get to the campsite. Mac grinned. It made the skin around his eyes crease in a way that made him look more approachable and less of a misery guts. I'm putting my faith in his assistant's understanding that we're going to need more than military iron rations to stop us from rioting and walking out, he said, and the grumpiness was a lot less in evidence now. He sounded almost cheerful. Hey! It was Sebastian calling us. Over here, everybody. Gather round. Junior's found something. Mac and I exchanged another look then began hauling ourselves over the leg-breaking terrain towards the track. Behind us, Kanga and Ruth were making their way slowly over the moorland, Ruth half supporting the weight of Kanga's pack. We could hear Kanga's voice, raised in complaint, even though we'd got our own body weight in wool pulled over our ears. This 
is ridiculous. I mean, why do we have to walk? Why can't we go to a hotel, set up some bait and the cameras, and wait for the big cats to come to us? We could record what comes in and there. Proof and job done, while we get a massage and swim. Ruth, wisely, said nothing. I mean, all this walking and mud and these awful clothes, is it really necessary, Ruth? Is it? Kanga rambled on, but only in the verbal sense. Physically, she had stopped walking altogether, presumably to add emphasis to her dislike of the activity. And now what are they doing? Junior's found a print, Sebastian yelled over. Junior was bent over the sandy path, his nose almost touching the ground. He seemed to be sniffing the soil. Yep, yeah, could be, he said laconically. Looks feline. Big, too. I, who had previously held no particular views on large cats and their existence in the British countryside, suddenly found a well of disbelief under my muddy surface. Oh, come on. Really? On our first day? I reckon the production team planted this to give us something to find. Everyone turned to look at me. There was a silence that seemed to be outlined by the blinking of their camera on lights, the distant barking of a faraway dog, and an almost palpable hostility. Even Mac, who'd seemed friendly a moment or two ago, was regarding me with a degree of antagonism. He was the first to speak. So, you're accusing my brother of fixing things? His words were cold. I thought of Dax and his somewhat random, let's drop a bunch of people on the moors, make them walk about and film what happens. Uh, uh no, I said, trying not to sound placatory, because I didn't want to give away that it was exactly what I'd been thinking. N not as such. So, you think I don't know what I'm doing? Junior had straightened up. You saying that? No. I really hadn't thought this through. No, of course not. I had, apparently, become the bad guy member of the team without even trying. God, I hope they cut this bit out in the edits. So, what are you saying, Izzy? Kanga put her hands on her hips. Are you trying, perhaps, to sabotage this mission? So, it's a mission now, is it? I asked, stung. A minute ago, you thought we could hang up half a sheep, set up the cameras and go and lie by a pool somewhere. Sebastian stepped in between us, hand held up. All right, all right. Izzy, maybe we got lucky. How about that? Junior rumbled something below hearing frequency. Kanga continued to keep her hands on her hips, and with the width of her rucksack, it made her look as though she was attempting to catch enough updraft to lift off. Everyone else dropped their eyes and muttered. I think, Max said at last, slowly, that we have to consider this as a genuine sighting. Whether or not it's been faked up for us to find, and even with my brother being a total idiot and having got the only good name in the family, I can't believe he'd do something that stupid. We have to follow the tracks, if we can. What about the bacon? Ruth asked, which was the first sensible question I'd heard for a while. We're still on target for the new camp and breakfast. Sebastian consulted the map. This footprint... Junior boomed inaudibly. Sorry, this paw print could well be here because this is the first place where the soil is capable of holding a proper, identifiable mark. Sebastian finished. I looked back at the couple of miles of soggy moorland we'd just crossed. There was mud out there that would have shown if someone had whispered in the last decade. But what with not wanting to become the nasty nick of the team, I tried to keep my look as unsarcastic as I could. Is he? What do you think? Sebastian asked. If you really think it's a fake, then we can declare this whole thing pointless and ask to be taken home. Oh. Now that wasn't fair, making me responsible. And, I thought cynically, if the production team were planting evidence, they
then maybe they were aiming on us actually winning the £250,000. But any plan that could possibly end in me being a quarter of a million pounds richer had to be worth working through, surely. No, I'm sorry, I said. I I didn't really mean it. It seemed very coincidental, that's all. But coincidences happen all the time, don't they? No reason this should be sinister. Mac hugged his arms around his body. Agreed, then. We go on. Before we all freeze to the ground and have to be chipped out of the mud like a really unsuccessful polar mission? It may have been my imagination, but it did look as though he gave me a tiny wink. But that could have been the tassels from his hat blowing in his eye. Must we? Kanga had started to unshoulder her rucksack, presumably in preparation for rescue. Group consensus. Sebastian had refolded the map. We agreed when we set out up here that the group would take priority over individual decisions. Unless you want us to leave you here to wait, in case the cat comes back this way. Kanga shivered dramatically. Absolutely not. I do not intend to end my life as a pile of bones mauled by a mythical beast. That is the way to become a side piece in the Daily Mirror or something. With the aid of Ruth, she began to struggle her pack up again. And nobody wants that. Slowly, we began our trek over the hills again. It was easier now we'd hit a proper path. We didn't have to lift our knees like a group of chorus girls over the deep growth of heather, which was reduced by the early winter winds to tripwire stalks and horribly stunted twigs.